gonna have esteemed panelists give your name, bio, everything you want everybody to know about you. So let's start with you. Uh, my name is Sharon Falad Mercer, uh, CEO, co-founder of Air PR. My quick bio is a computer science geek at Princeton and uh, played hockey there. I was a VC at Sierra Ventures and an entrepreneur in residence at Shasta Ventures and uh, uh, got an MBA from Harvard, uh, somewhere in between all that. Uh, that's my quick background, and I'll run air here. That sucks to be after. <laughs> I'm not even going to give And mine. I'm done. <laughs> and I'm out, right? I'm out. I'm out. Uh, whatever. <laughs> I barely graduated pretty. college. Like, I'm it's sorry. so over. I, I just don't even want to be here today. Um, so uh, I'm the CEO of Tap Influence, and, um, you know, I'm a CEO, not, I didn't go to Harvard. I went to the Harvard of Texas, which is called Southern Methodist University. Thank you very much. Hook them, right. <laughs> kill them, ponies all over the place. People can relate, right? Um, and you know, my mission is to build the world's largest marketplace of influence. And so you know, our vision of bringing together you know, a great partner um, in Shroom here is to really start to talk about what it means to do influencer marketing, right? It's a buzzword. The Kardashians are involved, which is kind of everything in our lives now. Like, they have pervaded uh -huh. Silicon Valley. Yep. But it's to, um, to make it real. And so that's why I'm here tonight. Um, I'm not a data scientist, mm -hmm. but uh, I have a chemistry degree. Does that, does that count? <laughs> that's more that's impressive than all of them. Okay, good. <laughs> And I'm just excited to be here tonight with all of you, and I'm, I'm thankful for my team who put all this together. And uh, when I grow up, I want to look like this man. So, uh, <laughs> what else? It's the next haircut. Yeah, it's the next I'm haircut. ready. <laughs> yeah, I'm really screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm Susan at Linger, and when I grow up, I want to look like both of you. Yes. Um, so I'm a history analyst, and I work with Brian Solis, who many of you uh, may know, who's the author of the report that uh, folks are going to be sending out. To you a little bit later on the state of social influence. Uh, I focus at, at Altimeter on things like data and art artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. And um, there's really no way to focus on data and focus on social without running into influence one way or another. And so I've been looking at things like ROI and understanding business value of social and digital technologies for a really long time, first as an agency person and now as an analyst, essentially, so I can um, find where the bodies are buried and tell all my agency <laughs> friends that they don't suffer <laughs> the way that I did. So that's why I'm here, and I'm thrilled to join you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm Kyle. Um, I work for a venture capital firm called OpenView in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we invest in expansion state software companies, so that's usually about Series B. Um, before that, I built the content team at Exact Target and then led content at the Salesforce Marketing Cloud and then jumped ship and moved to Boston from Indianapolis, which is a whole other story. I barely graduated college. Um, I had to go a fifth year to get my GPA even high enough to graduate, so I shouldn't even be up here, so I'm very blessed to be here in general. Okay, so we're gonna do a few questions. I have a few um, predetermined questions and then we're gonna open it up to everybody to ask questions, and if you don't ask, I'm going to point you out, so make sure you <laughs> write down questions you want to ask, because I will call you out. Um, so, Sharon, first question for you, and of course, anybody can answer, give your opinions. Um, Technology has made it possible for social interactions to go from physical to digital. How has that changed the concept of influence or influence marketing? Uh, I think it's become much more powerful now that you're giving the ability for the brilliant introvert to actually speak out. And that hasn't existed in the past before. Um, a lot of it's been either a one-to-many relationship that's existed on broadcast, um, but you've had some of these really brilliant folks that have been given a platform and a voice for the first time to be able to communicate, um, as, well as, the, as well as the celebrity or the Kim Kardashian of the world to make more tapes or whatever it is they want to do. And now I can communicate those to the world um, in a one-to-many or a one-to-one -one channel. And that hasn't happened before. And the power of this can't possibly be understated. And so now we have the ability to actually measure that for the first time sure. and, uh, and leverage platforms uh, like Tap Influence to tie into people to provide that 
and harness that power for the first time. And that's when things get really interesting because once you can identify these folks and once you can measure that, you can really actually step up your game to do some pretty impressive things, which we'll talk about. Perfect. Susan? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this is that you know, social is now, what, 10-ish years old, right? We've been in this for a decade at least. And you know, those of you who are from that before, you know, uh, even longer. And, and, and we're still, to some degree, struggling with what social technologies and social business means within enterprise and still struggling with ways to get messages out. And I think one of the things that comes through in, this, in, the, in the research so, so strongly is, is that struggle is, that the struggle is real. Um, partly what's happening is that organizations don't know where to put influencer marketing. They put it in social. Social, as I'm sure all of you know, um, is now part of digital in many large organizations. And so it tends to, the, the influence that it had in, say, 2011 has now been diffused quite a bit or it puts it in uh, marketing or puts it somewhere else. But part of the challenge is, um, is actually figuring out where the, real values li where the real value lies and measuring that in a way that executives um, will respond to. And, and that comes down to fundamental like revenue generation, operational efficiency, customer value, you know, stuff that's pretty straightforward but laddering that influencer into, or that set of influencers into those metrics has been a bit of a challenge. Well, and I think the, the overall definition of what an influencer is, is different as well, right? So for the report that you guys put together, um, you talked about really a terrible interpretation of popularity as influence. And that's and I, I really want to dive into that because I think it's very important to understand as marketers. Yeah, it's it's the Kim, it's the Kardashian effect, right? It's the idea that if you put something in the hands of a celebrity, things will happen. And I will tell you, I mean, Brian and I look at this from very different perspectives. I look at stuff from the data perspective, and I just looked at I just wrote a report on image intelligence, which is actually has to do with using artificial intelligence to understand the impact of images. And one of the things that comes through over and over and over again is that. You know, for example, if you're talking about food bloggers, it's not the celebrity who shares um, a product in a recipe. It's actually the, the people who are out there That's writing right. about food every single week, who have passionate followings, um, who nobody's ever heard of. And, and yet, it's easier to put money behind a Kim K or somebody, or a Kylie or a Kendall or somebody else whose name starts with the K. The entire family. Um, <laughs> it's easier to do that because people understand that as opposed to saying, oh, well, there's this woman, you know, Susan Etlinger, who writes this food blog for, like, vegan, you know, Sagittarians, <laughs> and she's got, like, all of this following, and people are like, yeah, that's a celebrity, whatever. But it turns out that those people are the ones um, <coughs> who are really doing the work. And, you know, any of you who, who look at this kind of stuff, you know, understand that intuitively, but putting that into a business context can be a struggle. I, I love that, and if I can build on it, yeah, I think our sure. theme tonight is the struggle. <laughs> and, we all feel it. you know, if you're a marketer, like, your job is very simple. Your job is to help your company more, most efficiently find your next customer. Like, at the end of the day, that's what marketing is, right? Yes. That's what marketers do. And, you know, I love to, I'm going to draw an analogy. These are dangerous sometimes. Um, remember Inbound, right, sister? It was all about, we're going we're gonna to create content. And then our SDRs are going to blast every in the world. <laughs> and we're going to wake up in the morning and 0.002% are going to be people who are interested in engaging with us, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That era is over. So what did we do? We went back to ABM, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm 20. And <laughs> when I started my career, mm -hmm. we had this thing called account-based marketing. And what is account-based marketing? It's ABM. Yeah. And what happens is that the approach of blast and kind of fire and forget doesn't help you find your next customer. It makes you feel like you're doing a lot of things to do that, but it doesn't work. And so the way that we think about influence is now we go from a digital age where you're blasting and you're programmatic and you're DMP and you're all this other stuff that makes you feel good, it's activity, but it doesn't translate in a world of ad block, social influence, et cetera. So from, from our perspective, technology, going back to your question, Kyle, is supposed to remove the areas of friction around that process. And the area of friction is the Kardashians are easy to find. 
And so what, what, what I want to do, and, and I think what AirPR does amazingly well, is who are the right people to be having the right conversation? How much does it cost to engage them? What's the performance of what they do? And how does it help you find your next customer? And maybe it doesn't. But the areas of friction around influence are great. And I think what, happens ten what tends to happen is we overpay. We get the wrong people. We engage them in the wrong way. And we expect it to drive revenue results when actually there's a longer process and influence takes time. So from, from our perspective, technology removes those tension points and removes the friction out of that process of mm -hmm. going from someone giving feedback on my brand, talking about my brand, to it actually resulting in profitability and revenue. And so we want to sort of take that whole process and remove the points of friction in it, which are massive. Absolutely. Well, let's, so let's stay on the B2B side of this, ABM which I thought was a new idea, but apparently it's not. Sorry, brother, when you're 20. <laughs> um, I'm definitely not 20. Um, so B2C marketing has done really well, and this is for you, Sharon. This is, I'm going to throw this at you. B2C marketing, I think, has done well what they think they have done really well at, at getting influencers. What, what does B2B, because I think that B2B always tends to trail B2C for a lot of reasons. Um, what does B2B marketers have to do in order to break through that influencer type marketing idea? Or at least you get it at a large scale. Yeah, I mean, the reality is is that the focus for a B2B marketer is, is it can be extremely niche. Or a consumer marketer, it's just, it's so broad. Mm -hmm. And I think to this example we were just yeah. talking about, you could have an article that appears in Forbes and you're like, oh, 30, 40 million uniques, 30, 40 million people go to Forbes every day. You could have seven people that read it. <clears throat> you could have ten of those, and if it's you're porting, struggle. yeah, if you're porting the wrong metric, suddenly you're like, well, I, I, I reached everybody in the U.S. Three hundred million people saw this thing, and all you really would need to do is find a half decent blogger, not even amazingly influencer blogger, That's right. <clears throat> a half decent blogger, and they would get more of an effect for you and your brand than ten of those articles to one of the top tier publications. And this is how the world has changed. Because 10 years ago, 20 years ago, everybody knew these are the 10 or the 20 magazines to focus your efforts on. Those days are gone. So, so I'll, Susan, I'll throw this at you from the enterprise perspective. Are those, so I, I agree that the trend is there. Are the days really gone that that's not, I think it's still happening, right? I guess the whole point of this conversation is to say it shouldn't, mm -hmm. and you should use influencers to replace that, right? But, yeah. you know, where do you think B2B needs to go in order to well, drive it? you know, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> and he, he, All the above. Here's what I mean by that cryptic comment. Um, you know, reach is really a stupid metric, <laughs> unless you're an advertiser. Yeah. Uh, what you care about in B2B is the relationship and understanding the steps of moving somebody or moving with somebody through a particular buying cycle. The only way to understand that is to have technology that helps you see how people respond. Did they download your white paper? If you're a test and measurement company and you've got like 40 relevant Twitter mentions every day, why are you looking at that? Like, why not? <laughs> Why? Can you say that again? Can you just repeat that? This is going to be a therapy session. Yes, right. it is. <laughs> um, those seven people who read the Forbes article um, could be, probably not on Forbes, but maybe on LinkedIn, maybe in a community, maybe somewhere else, um, maybe it's a blog. Those people could actually be qualified leads that if you have, in, if you have technology in place that enables you to see that, um, let's say, that network effect, then you can see that that person who sort of seemed like no big deal actually shared it with a ton of people. And those people shared it with a ton of people. And you know, if you want to sort of visualize this in your head, um, think back to when Osama bin Laden was killed. I know it sounds like a r r kind of bizarre com comparison. But when he was killed, there's a company, I think it was Social Flow, who did a really mm -hmm. interesting visualization of the first tweet that was made by a, ge uh, a, a gentleman who had worked for Donald Rumsfeld. And he uh, posted a tweet that said, and he had, had also very obviously very good media contacts and said, I've heard from a reliable source that Osama bin Laden has been killed. Um, and his name was Keith Urban, but not Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually the singer, <laughs> Keith Urban. Uh, but anyway, so if you saw the social flow thing, it looked like a star had exploded. So <laughs> what happened was 
He had 110 or so Twitter followers. Brian Stelter from the New York Times actually followed him and saw his tweet. Brian Stelter then took that tweet and sent it out, mm. and then you, that's where the supernova thing happened. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, overnight, the influence happened. Who would have predicted Candace freaking Payne, right? Mm. Now, it could be argued that Candace Payne's moment is over, and she sold a you know truckload of Chewbacca masks, and that will never happen again. Mm. But if you can see the visualization of how that data moves through time and space, then you can run to your executive at your brand, at your B2B brand, and say, actually, I see six people who are consistently moving content through the system and consistently resulting in conversions. And those are the people that we want to cultivate. And so the answer to the question is, is, is yes, because the answer to the question is technology and data. Influence is influence, but it works differently in B2B than in B2C. For sure. Uh, Promise this one's for you, and we're so we're going to go back to channels. So we talked about Twitter. We're going to go back. Who's using show of hands audience engagement here? Who's using Periscope, Facebook Live? We are here today. Hey, everyone on Facebook, Snapchat. Can you delete the part where I said he was pretty? We bleeped it. We bleeped it. it. Um, Instagram Stories, yeah, right? Um, so I think in general, all of these new things that are happening are changing the way that we communicate, right? right? It's changing the digital landscape. How, how do these tools affect influencer marketing and how is it changing influencer marketing? The newer, yeah, and not Pokemon Go. I don't want to talk about Pokemon Go. <laughs> okay, so I'll quickly answer that and then I, I have a corollary on the dark side of influencer marketing. Okay. Um, so because it's warm in here, and so we're going to have to get intimate. But all those channels are essentially now um, places where your brand lives, whether you know it or not. And so I, I think to your point, conversations are happening on all those platforms about your competitors, about your brand. And so you have to have a presence. Yeah. And with the, you know, the focus, you know, we're venture backed. You can't have 50 people who own channels. So you need influencers to be the amplifiers of, of the right messages for your company. So, you know, every channel grows your marketing costs exponentially if you try to do it with people. Right. It grows it incrementally if you do it with people who love your brand. So let's go back to the dark side. Love your brand. Um, so we pump out tens of thousands of dollars in influencer programs every day. And that has a, 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 a you know, resident impact on revenue of those companies, blah, blah, blah. But there are also tens of thousands of programs that don't happen. So they're influencers. We have a high acceptance rate of people who, who you know, want to work on programs for various different companies. But we also have influencers who don't work on programs for certain brands. And so we look at that data, too. What that data tells us is that if a brand is using influencer marketing to promote a shitty product or a bad idea, those influencers will not represent that brand. And so one of the things that I feel like influencer marketing doesn't get enough credit for are the people who say, no, I'm not doing it. And so the power of influencer marketing is that amplification. It is the ability to get your message in all these different channels, but for good brands, it's also a feedback loop when your product isn't good and when the experience isn't good. Because, hmm. you know, what do they say? A woman scorned? An influencer scorned. <laughs> right? And so what, what I would encourage all of us, people in the room who are thinking about it, is they, this is actually forcing you to build great products. And it's bringing the marketer closer to the product team and the distribution team and the pricing team. And so I look at my own company, like, you know, my, my head of marketing spends a lot of very intimate time with our CTO because he's getting customer feedback. And that feedback has to, has to go inside the company or influencer marketing loses its ability to be impactful because influencers have to, at their core, be believers. Well, and I think, and Sharon, I want you to add on to this. Um, I think that the power of, of platforms like G2 Crowd and where you're getting feedback on, on your software, especially from a B2B standpoint, is really powerful. But praise is bullshit, right? Amen. And the the idea that influencers can give you a feedback loop where you can improve your brand or product is very powerful. And I actually did not think about that. And that's that's something that should be harnessed maybe even more than 
lean startup? Yeah, Hello? absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So let's go back to the, well, I think it all ties together, but the channels and how they're changing the influencer marketing in general, the dark, the dark influencer side as well as the light. Um, what do you think about in terms of the new tools? Uh, I just think it's providing such a faster way to move that hasn't existed before. And it's, uh, the amount of change that's occurring scares a lot of people. And I think that uh, right. PR, I think content, there are so many things under marketing that didn't exist before. Before it was just advertising and PR. That's all that really existed in the world. Now there's earned, owned, thought leadership, content marketing, native advertising, social, branded channel. I mean, there's a whole host of, of things. Sure. Uh, you have industries that are even bigger than PR now. Content marketing is even bigger than, than PR is. Um, and so everything, you'll have one Fortune 500 group where social is under content, which is under PR. You have another where social's split off. So everyone's kind of trying to figure this out. And when you throw in a real-time platform like this, where content is a part of it, uh, as well as figuring out what right channel it is and who you're going to target, it's now become a situation where people are trying to figure out who to target, who should be doing the content, and who should execute. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion is the way the world is going to move is that PR, social, that group will be in charge of writing all content. The advertiser will be in charge of executing it on all of the different platforms that exist out there. And then you're going to have an analytics hub in the middle that's going to be in charge of taking what just occurred, measuring it and saying, hey, the message needs to change to this, the theme needs to be written about this, they'll get it rewritten again by the content person, gets uh, slash PR, it gets sent over to the advertiser to execute on all of the channels simultaneously or in coordination with each other, and then go back to being measured. And so we're just starting to see that at some of the largest brands in the world where they're dedicating entire teams to just focus on that internally. Um, but it's a long answer to the question of, what do I think about this new channel? I think a lot of people are still trying to figure it out. And there's no good way to measure some of this stuff. So just throwing stuff against the wall, seeing what sticks, and then trying to do correlation, correlations to it. You guys think that applies to B2B as well? I mean, Snapchat makes sense to me from a B2C perspective, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see. I mean, Pinterest is great for B2B too. Yeah, You know, people True. use it for content. I think Snapchat could be a great B2B platform eventually. Probably, well, maybe even maybe Instagram, I don't know. I think here's here's why, because eventually what will happen? Like we we've probably seen that um, you know some Facebook is taking some WhatsApp data and making that available, right? So we're going to see ways in which uh, as social moves as as communication moves into messaging and these more sort of ephemeral and one to one platforms, brands are going to desperately want to understand what's going on there. And so there's going to have to be ways to aggregate, maybe not to the individual level, right, because of privacy reasons, but to start to put together, um, you know, segments of people who like, you know, yogurt and segments of people who like Supreme shoes and segments of people who like other things. Um, all that is such a complex kind of um, simultaneous equation that there is no way to kind of pick a set of channels and a set of customers and know that that's going to remain static. So it has to be technology that constantly is understanding and learning from, and probably AI too, machine learning, that's going to learn from what happens under what circumstances that leads to what outcome. We see this incrementally and anecdotally every single day. We see that people talk about, um, you know, the business intelligence tells us one thing about what people like, but then people are talking about something else on Twitter, which becomes a leading indicator. Mm -hmm. We see that there's tremendous amount of uptake of certain content on Snapchat, but we can't measure it back. We see Pinterest putting buy buttons. We see all of the digital channels kind of that are conventional exploding. And I think eventually what we really need is this, you know, as Sharon said, this sort of, you did say this, right? This sort of kind of intelligence hub, um, maybe that's data in the DMP, maybe that's data elsewhere, that actually brings together those signals and gives you something meaningful so that you're not just desperately saying, reach or celebrity or something in order to be able to make a business case. So I was going to go to the FTC, but I think I'm going to hold on that because we're kind of talking about the MarTech stack. Promise, you have a company, we do software that. solution. <laughs> yeah, this sounds like my roadmap, yeah, when do you think When do you think that influencer marketing is going to be fully integrated into the stack? Well, I, I think there's been some good points here. Um, I mean, 
our goal is to, again, remove all that friction, right? So we want you to find influencers not based on their popularity. We want you to find them based on their audience and based on the efficacy of the content. We want you to monitor that. We want So I think a lot of that's happening. Um, whether or not it's going to become int integrated into the, Mar the MarTech stack requires one thing. It has to be able to help companies find the next customer. Go back to that. Yeah. So the, the where we started, so I joined TAP about a year and a few months ago, and where we started was we actually did a Nielsen study to look at all the programs that we were running, and we picked the ones that were the highest performing. And we reverse engineered from those programs, which drove actual revenue in store. So we embedded pixels, and we did a bunch of different things. And we found that it actually does drive revenue. And then from there, we said, OK, where are the ways we can make this process more efficient? And so we obviously have to do a lot more of that, because um, that was just kind of a window. But I think once influencer marketing can be predictable, once influencer marketing can be scalable and trusted and measurable, which we are obviously working on. So if any of my VCs are listening, I got this. Um, <laughs> It will become part of the marketing stack, but I, I guess part of my, I have a little bit of agitation about this because I believe that influencer marketing is not going to be a PR ownership. It's going to be something that's owned across the organization. Okay. Think what, yeah. if, if you look at how marketer, marketers are growing their skill stack, everyone's got SEO, everyone's got SEM, everyone's got social, everyone. So influencer marketing will become another critical bullet point and capability of a lot of different types of marketers. I don't think it should live in any one organization. I think it should be purpose driven. Mm -hmm. If your organization is trying to drive growth and revenue and scale, put that thing in digital. Because you know what? A VP of digital will sell influencer marketing like crazy if it drives revenue, yeah. right? So I would, you know, and this makes my sales motions harder, but I would advocate for it being wherever the purpose is of that organization. Right now, we're seeing companies have VPs of influence. Like, that's wild. Yeah. Um, but those people actually influence the other organizations and within marketing. So. I don't know that we're going to be part of the marketing stack, but we're definitely going to immediately be part of the marketing consideration and budget, which is more important to me than being connected to, like, Omniture or whatever. Like, we can do that ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. But it's more about, is it part of the repertoire of every marketer? And I think it should be. Yeah, Would you agree sure. with that? Yeah, 100% yeah, agree. I think, I think right now, uh, it's such a new, um, it's such a new thing that people are just starting to realize once they use it for the first time how powerful it can be. That's right. And so you're lighting, <laughs> you're not lighting the log, you're not lighting uh, the kindling, you're lighting a tiny little corner of this thing and watching the fire start. And I think people, where we are right now, is just you're lighting literally the, the, the corner. That's where we are. That's right. And the potential of this is enormous. It's massive. Uh, and as a result it'll be one of those things where it should touch every part of the org. And if it's done correctly, and if it can be measured right. um, uh, correctly, then we could really uh, be something enormous. And I think that's what the real power of this is. Because it ha you can actually focus this on an individual for the first time that has exactly the audience that you want to target. Yes. Where they listen to you as an unbiased third party. And there is nothing more powerful than having an unbiased right. third party talk about you, potentially. think the dark side is a huge opportunity Amen. and and the reason is that you know okay as an analyst I love it when people take my advice <laughs> say, and especially because you know I like to be diplomatic when I give bad news but also I really appreciate it when clients take bad news well and, and actually think about it and um, either either disagree with me vociferously and change my mind or disagree with me vociferously and don't change my mind but if they go off and do something about it, that's always really validating. And I would imagine that any influencer feels that way. Um, the other thing is, part of the challenge here is that so much of this stuff has up till now been invisible. And right. so if you don't know that it's actually this one little glitchy thing about you know the dress or the shoes or whatever that is bothering people, if you don't know because you can't get scale on that right. and you just see one or two things, mm -hmm. you know, we can do that. And, well enough in social stuff right now, although arguably it's getting harder. Um, you know, we can do that well enough, but you can't, you know, we haven't been able to do that well enough in aggregate at scale with influence. And I think that, you know, when you say the opportunity is massive, I think it is. And I think that that also leads into a value proposition that has much more to do with care of the customer and the customer relationship right. than it does with, like, pushing marketing crud down a pipe. 
which has been our what was our pre our model of the last you know millennium. Perfect. Um, I have last one last question, and then I'm going to open it up. And then, like any good moderator, I'm going to end on the Kardashians and the government. <laughs> the government, of course. <laughs> Uh, so FTC is all over, Kardashians, Warner Brothers, right? I mean, it's been in the news. Um, the report that everybody's going to get, that everybody should read, basically said that the influencers that, that were surveyed, I don't even know if it was half. It might have been just 50% said that a brand actually told them about the F FTC guidelines. Right. Um, so that's crucial. Right. You know, how do you respond to that? The FTC and all this crap, of course, that they're throwing around. And the Kardashians are throwing around yeah. in general. Yeah. That's so, a separate question. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's the hard You question. can feel my page. I'm sorry. Sorry, Kim, if you're watching. I, mm -hmm. yeah. It's not Kim, you have to worry about. It's Chloe, brother. You know this. Right. Yeah. You know this. Right. All of them. Oh, I have to worry about all of them. The mama bear. <laughs> the mama bear. The mama bear. Yeah. That's right. No. Anyway, FTC. Yeah. I mean, the. We, we attempt so often to, over, to try to oversimplify things, and nothing about social is simple, right? Um, but at the end of the day, the FTC is doing its job because it's, it wouldn't, the FTC wouldn't do a damn thing if it didn't think this was actually going to be a significant and substantial new marketing channel. That's my belief. Because a year ago when I started, the FTC was like, here's some rough guidelines. Now they're like, what did you say? <laughs> and did you put pound down? Yeah. Right. Report. And yeah. that's good. Because what social requires is transparency and authenticity. And so influencers and, you know, we took that data, right, and we're like, we got to educate our influencers because our platform integrates it. But brands are still telling influencers, hey, you don't have to, you don't no. have to mention and I, the only way that influencer marketing is going to work is if we don't try to make it ad tech and we don't try to make it a DMP and we don't talk about units. These are actual people representing real products that they love or have been given the power to, to weigh in on. And so what we need to focus on first is that people love our stuff. And then, then platforms like ours should automate the rest of it. Yeah. But let's not... The, the risk is in oversimplifying it and saying like, hey, you're a food blogger, here's all my stuff. No, you gotta earn that. Yeah. So um, I guess to, to, to kind of wrap it up, um, I'm sad about what happened with the Kardashian. I think it's, un, I think it's inappropriate, I think it's um, unnecessary. Um, I think consumers are wise enough to say, oh, this must be sponsored, okay, I'm gonna give it a little less credibility, you know? Yeah. Consumers are wise, and so I just I feel it was unnecessary, but it was a good lesson for my company. We've got tens of thousands of influencers to educate them. Like this is not good, this will be bad for your brand. So um, I'm glad it happened. I'm disappointed that it needed to happen the way that it did, but I guarantee the FTC is looking much more closer at this because it works. Sure. It works. Susan Sharon, you want to add that? Yeah, I mean I'm I'm you know I don't feel too bad for them. <laughs> Clearly, I don't either. No, I mean, I don't mean that in a in a in a, in a snotty way. I just I, I don't because I think that I think that first of all, this is a this is an issue all the way around. It's not just that, right? Um, and I think part of it too is that we are we, there are a lot of gray areas. Um, and and when I see you know I, I look at a lot of blogs and a lot of stuff you know stuff that may or may not be sponsored, and a lot of times I can't tell. And I'm supposed to know these things, right? And uh, and sometimes I'm looking at them as a you know as a professional, and sometimes I'm looking at them as a as, a, as a just a regular person. Um, I think that what needs to happen is that the the FTC is laying down the law for bloggers themselves. But the reality is we have to take the friction out for the influencers. Too, That's right. Right. There has to be a way. And usually when go when there's government intervention on these things, it's usually like really great intentions and completely misguided um, execution. Um, in this case, what I hope is that it actually spurs some interest in, in, in actually making this scalable and taking the friction out of it. And by taking the friction out of it, then it just becomes a whole lot clearer. And I do, I have to say, I don't have a lot of sympathy for marketers who are like, but we were squeezing by and it was so great. Like, because, because the truth of the matter is that eventually that will undercut them. That's right. Um, that's what makes this stuff work, is that it's just great. 
Um, that's what makes those surprising meme, you know, viral videos great because they just work and there's something mm -hmm. authentic. And nobody cares if it's Dove or the British tampon company or whoever the heck it is who did, or or you know, Dolly Shave Club. They don't care that it was a brand because it was great. And I, so I'm, I'm kind of like a hard ass about it because I think we need to just aspire to be great, and then we also need to do that in a way that you know we can do as businesses and not just you know out of the back back of the truck. Wow, Sharon, last words. Sorry, I ran well, that, that No, I, I love it. I was, I was mentioning this before. I think this is a great opportunity. I mean, with all of these things, the pendulum swings in different directions, and people take advantage of these situations. And we've seen numerous bloggers that haven't acknowledged that they're getting paid for, for different things, and it's happened a lot. And I'm, I'm waiting now for the time when someone that's not influential starts to hashtag everything they say as an ad because then people think they're influential and they're getting paid for stuff. <laughs> So it would be a really interesting way for them to now take advantage of this uh, opportunity that... Uh, and then the IRS will come calling. Exactly. So I think the, <laughs> the end result is the IRS comes calling. Uh, no, I think this is a, it's just really interesting watching the re, that we'll watch the result of, uh, of what happens here. But I think I, I agree with uh, uh, what Promise and Susan has said, which is this, this, I think, gives more visibility and makes this more well-known to everybody. That's right. So. All right. All of you. Um, questions. Yeah. So right along these lines of like trying to figure out who an influencer is and whether or not they're legitimate, I'm kind of curious as to what metrics you look at besides reach. You mentioned earlier like the efficacy of what they write and what they publish. How do you measure that? It's a great question. So um, it's a major point of friction, which is, is this person real? Is their following real? Um, what are they good at talking about? So the, 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 what our platform tries to do is get the influencer to tell us about themselves, because they're aspirational. They want to represent certain ideas, certain brands. And we, we've used data science to essentially look past the influencer and look at their audience. How engaged are they? Who are they? What are their ages, races? Where do they live? What shows do they watch? And who influences them? Um, and so. That's one layer, so we allow you essentially to say, I want to focus on my audience, my next customer. And so you can do that, but the, the metric that we, we look at most is something we call cost per engagement or cost per view. So there are a lot of influencers who will say, my reach is massive, man. Pay me $45,000 to create uh, you know, a Snapchat dear voice meme um, for you, and brands will do it. Because the, the person has like huge reach. And so what we do is we go, okay, go, go create that video. We're going to actually track the number of people who engage with it. So click, share, what have you, or eventually go make a purchase. And then we track that back to the cost. And so we actually show it on both sides so that the influencer can say, oh, boy, that's, my cost per engagement is not good, right? So my cost is high. I got low engagement. Half my followers might be fake, or people didn't like the content, or I've done too much sponsored content. There's a correlation, right? The, the, the percentage of the ratio of sponsored content to non-sponsored content has a direct correlation to engagement. And so we use cost per engagement as a way to essentially say this influencer is good and the content they create is good tied back to the value that they create. And so what happens is the better influencers, even if they're not popular, they rise up because the engagement is high and they've worked hard to create that following. And so we use that as sort of a proxy for performance on both an influencer level and then a program level. That's cool. Thank you. Can I, can I add to that? Yeah. I, I, think, it's, I think it's good um, to, have, to have a metric like that. And I, I think, you know, I tend to think, and I'm, you know, not to overcomplicate it, but I, I said before that reach is stupid, and it is kind of stupid if you use it all by itself. You know, if you just do this, because that's just basically spraying pray as a KPI. Um, but then, you know, you look at the cost per engagement, and then you can move, and then you move down the so-called funnel or through the life cycle, whatever you want to call it. And it's, it's a cup now. It's a cup. And then you look at the conversion piece, which is, of course, al almost always invisible um, until we start putting, at least, in, until we start decoupling commerce from um, mm. websites. Um, and so what, what I tend to want to do is look at, all of those things together and start to see where the heat is. 
Because a lot of times you'll see, you know, any of you who have ever run a social marketing program know that if you're measured by conversion, you're going to die. Right. Um, and if you're measured by um, reach, you, you really just don't know what happened. And so there is, and so the engagement piece is important because it shows something is happening, right. and you're, but you're still not at the outcome. And so I guess my answer here is that the technologies for measurement need to get better at attribution yeah. in order for us to be able to square the circle. And when that happens, we'll be able to do that. And this is why you see everybody with the freaking buy buttons, which, of course, you can imagine a buy button infested world where you've got, like, your Amazon buy on your, you know, dishwasher, and then you've got Pinterest buy and, and stuff. That's, that's just a temporary thing. Yep. Uh, but eventually we're going to get to a place where we can actually yes. measure an entire relationship. Yes. Yeah, and I think the uh, important thing to, to mention, and Promise alluded to this as well, which is, you know, the stuff is designed to bring the horse to the well, not to force it to drink. So if your product sucks, your sales team is terrible, you, you know, you don't have what people want and you're attracting that kind of person, it's not going to work. And so, you know, these are all valuable metrics getting down to the conversion or whatever it may be to figuring out if that's a good proxy for the right person. Right. But you need to understand that and fix the things that are outside the realm of what you're doing in the first place. Can I tell place. you a quick story? Yeah, by all means, let's so, do it. So um, my team knows this, and they should never mention the brand name. But when we bring on a big customer, we become obsessive. We didn't go to Harvard, so we just do the opposite. We just like, <laughs> just like work our asses off, right? So we go out, and we actually test the brand. We want to be customers of all of our customers. And so there's this one brand, and so they spend billions of dollars on like advertising and getting people to like go to their stores and buy shit, and blah, 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 <laughs> right? And so um, our team visited 22 of their stores, and we spent like several thousand dollars buying their stuff. And so we'd end every transaction by going to the, so the store associate and saying, on camera, tell me who your customer is. And they go, corporate says our customer is a millennial, but it's actually a woman between 25 and 45. <laughs> and the sales associate isn't wearing the company's clothing. The sales associate has a bun in their hair and has a stamp from last night. <laughs> Word, okay? <laughs> okay. She was partying and, um, and doesn't represent the brand. So, so that level of disconnect doesn't work. Like, yeah. I see, it all comes back to authenticity and reality, right? So this brand is spending billions of dollars to get people in their store. The store is beautiful and shiny and everything's exciting. Yeah. And we go and we just press a little bit and we realize your people don't actually believe in what it is you're saying or what the yeah. ads say or whatnot. And so all of that money is lost at, at the transaction. So it gets all the way to the bottom of the funnel to the point of sale where they've spent thousands of dollars getting you in the store and poof, you don't buy. <laughs> and so I think what it comes back to is we have to track and measure, but let's be great, to your point. Let's be great companies, let's have great employees, let's have people who believe, let's write. So it all comes back to that. It, there's, no, there's no quick fix to this. Look, we're, we're all marketers. We're all, we're all communications experts and ninjas and social marketers, or whatever the hell you want to call yourselves. But it, at the end, we're experience managers, that's and right. that's really the only thing that makes us relevant. If the experience is bad, it does not matter how good you are at marketing. And I think that is, whether it's influence marketing or data or attribution modeling or anything, depending on if it's B2C or B2B, that's really the core of all this, is really the experience and how people interpret that for your that's brand. Right. Um, questions, any other questions? Yeah, have um, have either of you started to uh, gather or work with data that has anything to do with advocacy marketing? So, going beyond the layer of a potential influencer right. and looking at a consumer talking to another consumer and what that looks like, and if so, what what's in it for that consumer? If that makes sense. Uh, we looked at uh, tangentially. Um, there's a huge space starting to get it dedicated to this. Um, it's employee advocacy, and there's a couple of companies that started to tackle it. Um, it ends up being really tough, uh, both for companies to monetize the space, but also to convince or get those to 
occur naturally when you're kind of prodding your employees to, to do it, as you might imagine. Um, and I don't think there's been a good way to figure out and how to take advantage of the naturally occurring ones. I think some of the best companies are just monitoring their uh, the chatter in their space and watching for people talking yeah. about them <clears throat> and trying to interact and engage in that. And I think it might be an interesting thing if you could have an influencer <clears throat> ch uh, chime into to that. Um, the I mean, I, I, I've seen different examples of crisis comms moments where that's occurred, but nothing where um, two are just talking to each other and then someone has a plan in place where they just will go and interject into that conversation about them as much. And that's it seems to be like, anyway. Yeah. From a privacy perspective. I think it would be really interesting, though. But it's done in, <laughs> sorry, it's done in B2B. It's done in B2B. Right, exactly, right? exactly. Like, so in B2B, yeah. Influitive is the market mm -hmm. you know, category definer of advocacy marketing. Yep. And in B2B, your best salespeople aren't on your payroll. Right. They're your customers right. who are willing to advocate mm -hmm. for your product, your service, your people, your experience, your brand. And so that is actually being formalized <coughs> in B2B. And mm -hmm. what I have found is that you know a lot of companies are going about it the wrong way, where they're they're asking their customers to join the advocacy program, and what they're not doing enough of is being the best advocate of the customer first, mm. right? Earning that advocacy, um, one, through having not a shitty product, um, not having false advertising and marketing, not having you know a salesperson overpromise what can be delivered, not having you know drop the ball once the purchase is made. Um, but but I think if we do more to um, help our customers in what they want, not what we want. We want them to advocate for our brand, yeah. right? But if we help them in other ways, in B2B, then we're more likely to earn that advocacy. Yeah. And there's there's huge money in that. There's yeah, if you get the fundamentals down first, then yeah, it helps. <laughs> it, it, right, <laughs> no shitty product, yeah, yeah. no false advertising. Yeah. Yeah, basically I mean, I, the theme is don't have a crap. Don't have a crap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's gonna go great. But yeah. it, it, it is a struggle, right? And I, I think you point out some of the challenges with that. You need a great product, but you know. So Rachel Seiler, who's here, is one of our strategists, and she always says, "Hope I'm not misquoting her. A good influencer marketing program will turn an influencer into an advocate." And so I, I think when when you know we see great brands do great influencer marketing, and all of a sudden that influencer's like. This is awesome. Like I'm getting gift cards. I'm I'm influencing your products. I'm giving feedback. I'm getting early access. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if you look at this as a long tail, you know, money is important when it's a Kardashian, and if you pay them whatever you want to pay them, they'll do it. They'll do whatever. But on the end, it's about belief, right? If that's if that if that is about you know that that vector is a belief vector. It's about belief. And so a consumer talking to a consumer, um, I'm going to be telling you my experience and putting that brand into context in an authentic way. And what I want from the company is that they don't make me look bad to you. Um, and at scale, the way that it looks is those people, they don't really need to be paid. In most cases, they just want to say, I do not like what you know, what you did with this last line, or I don't like this car, or, I don't like this. And they want to be heard. And I think it's a, again, it's a relationship that you're building, it's an experience you're creating. But I believe in advocacy both as the direction in which an influencer can go for a brand, but also that's our pipeline for people to become future influencers, so it goes both ways. Uh, one, one Time for one more. I, in the back, I saw a couple hands in the back. I don't want to ignore the back row here. I had a question that we like kind of tapped on and then moved forward, but I think Thomas, you had sort of brought up the benefit of influencer marketing sitting with the VP of digital. And I'm curious if you might be able to just elaborate that. I'm sure in five years from now, influencer marketing will be a world of a difference. But, you know, it, I think from where we sit in PR, it sort of has evolved with who has focused on this. And even our influencer partners ask the same question. You know, where does the money come from? Who is the best partner? Marketing, PR, social, whatnot. So just curious, maybe just elaborate a little further. Yeah, so, so my point, and, and just to kind of take your question, your question is like, if it, lives in, if it lives in digital, what does it look like? But could it also live in PR? So you know, our, our PR brethren and sisters, you guys birthed this category, to be honest with you. Like, it, you know, I remember starting my career and someone saying like, we gotta talk to the analysts. And I was like, the analysts? What? They wanna look at our roadmap. 
And I was like, they would look at, wait, sorry, what? No, we're right. <laughs> and you know, you're the, you birthed this whole category by essentially saying, we can't get press unless people can react in advance, right? You come from that world a little bit, right? Part of it is you don't want to look like an idiot when somebody asks exactly. you a question about the product, right? Exactly. And a great analyst will say no. So my point is it's purpose driven. Mm -hmm. If the goal of the brand in a crisis moment is to get, like I saw with, with the whole Anthony Ro Tony Robbins thing when someone's feet got burned, an influencer came forward and said, I've had that experience, here's what happened, and it shut down like 30 articles, it was like, that's a purpose. Mm -hmm. The other purpose might be, you know what, we're introducing a new product and we want to have influencers talk about that product and then digital drives it. So it needs to be everywhere, yeah. all throughout the organization versus in, in any silo. So I feel like the measurement principles are the same, engagement, revenue, right? Um, but the ownership should be something where people are comfortable having it be in different places. So one of my customers has a really cool methodology. Can I, can I share it with you? Okay. They have something called the 1990, and it comes from like the old days, brother. You were not born, or you were at Harvard, or MIT. Or, right, where, where was that? Rhodes Scholaring, or some shit, right? Um, but they have 1990 principle. 1% 1 of their influencers are the people that they are deeply interact advocates, deeply, deeply engaged with. They can move the roadmap. They can accelerate the timing of a launch. They can do all these things. And PR is the manager of those relationships, right? There's the nine. They call them the creators. These are the people who are creating content they build on our platform. That's often owned by the social team or by the digital team. And then the 90 are the people who amplify the content. And so those 90, the, the engagement there is owned by digital. So the 1% influence the company, the 9% create content, and the 90% the amplify. And so that amplification is happening through digital. And so again, I think that's a really good example of like a partnership. And by the way, there's overlapping influencers between each of those organizations, but the 1990 is a framework that they use to figure out where pieces of that program fit. Is that helpful? Yeah, I mean, definitely. A lot of the conversations we talk about, and I'm sure many in this room, is distribution and amplification. And it's one part of the puzzle to make great content and have those conversations, and another part to make sure people are seeing it. Yeah. So that's super interesting. Thanks. All right, with that, I'm sure you guys aren't going to just run out of the room. <laughs> so you're going to be around. Sprint to chat. chat. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. I'm sure there's food back there still, right? And drinks. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Let's talk about the Kardashians. Yes. <laughs>